Thank you and good evening. Uh, welcome to, to Clontra and to our, our dress rehearsal, our, our, our novice night of uh, Gunos Faust. Um, wonderful to see you all, especially on such a glorious evening when there are so many temptations outside, I think. Um, I just thought before we started this evening, it might be useful for you to um, just have some idea about what we've been doing, how we're working on this piece and actually what the piece itself is. So just to kind of give me a kind of ballpark. How many of you are actually novices? How many are coming to an opera for the very first time? Oh, that's quite a good crowd. That's quite good. Right, well done. Thank you for that. Very good. Um, I hope it won't be too traumatic an occasion. Um, I have to confess that I first went to an opera when I was 11 years old. And I went because, um, well, the official story in my family is that my mother made a mistake with booking the ticket. <laughs> But I think that, strictly speaking, she wasn't really all that prepared for me to go to another performance of West Side Story. She thought I should go and see something else. So she arranged for me to go and see um, a performance of The Barber of Seville by Rossini, which is, let's face it, one of the funniest and brightest and easiest pieces to listen to and to experience. And um, I was a schoolboy at the time. It was pouring with rain. I was in the northeast of England in Newcastle. And the deal was that I would kind of make my own way to the theatre and then my parents would pick me up at the end of the performance. So you can imagine November night in Newcastle, pouring with rain, all that kind of thing. And this 11-year-old goes into the Theatre Royal in Newcastle and sits down and is bored witless <laughs> for about two hours. And I don't know why, there was just suddenly something happened and somebody laughed and I realised it was actually okay to enjoy it that it was actually on the cards for you to have a good time tonight. You weren't supposed to sit there and be serious and be kind of bamboozled by it all. It was actually popular entertainment and if you could enjoy it, you could enjoy it. If you didn't, then try it again and go and do something else. Within a couple of years, I was sort of going every time there was an opera on. And so I was enormously fortunate to have that, that very, very easy introduction. Of course, the great thing about The Barber of Seville is that it's a very accessible opera. It's a very easy opera. It was written at a time when opera was designed really as popular entertainment. It wasn't in the sense of, you know, of, of, as I say, of high art or something that came down from heaven or anything like that. It was very much the cinema or the television of its time. People went to it, they brought their sandwiches, they stayed all night, they might watch three or four pieces in the course of an evening, one of which might be the opera, and they gave you always the opinion that they felt absolutely from, from the heart. Um, and Guno's Faust belongs to that tradition. The Faust story is very strange because I suppose he's what they call a kind of, you know, what I suppose everybody nowadays is an icon, aren't they? But, you know, Faust is one of those kind of iconic figures, one of those paradigms. Um, but he's actually relatively recent um, in terms of being added to the canon of, of popular um, heroes and all that kind of thing. The first Faust recorded um, is somewhere in the middle of the 16th century, um, and it's thought to be based on true stories. It's based on some, some true legend or other about a man who actually did sell his soul to the devil in, term, in return not for something like eternal youth or eternal happiness or anything like that, but in return for um, the ability to turn base metals into gold. Um, this was picked up by uh, an Elizabethan playwright, Christopher Marlowe, who turned it into the kind of basic Faust story that we've got today. So um, it kind of went to sleep again for about another 200 years and then was picked up again towards the end of the 18th century when there'd been a whole rash of plays about reason and study and enlightenment and philosophical processes and all that kind of thing and people began to get very much more interested again in the emotions and the passions and the sentiments and so you get Faust kind of remade at the end of the 18th century and the principal person involved in all of that is the great German playwright um, Goethe. And Goethe is kind of the most influential and, and probably the most important playwright apart from Shakespeare in, in, in more, about, more or less about 400 years of, of theatre. And what Goethe did was he took Faust and instead of having him look after this great thing of wanting magical powers and the ability to transform base metals and make himself rich. He gave Faust the idea that what he wanted was eternal youth. He wanted to go back to his boyhood, having been a professor in a university. He'd wasted his entire life in study. And so what he wanted to do now was to go back and try again to get all of those things which had been deprived, which he'd been deprived of, which he'd been denied um, in, in, in his growing up and in, his, in his, his adult life. And what he wants more than anything else is the basic human experience of being in love. So he makes a deal with the devil and he goes back 
into um, his more or less his, 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 his teenage years, and you have this extraordinary idea that a man who starts the play at 70 or 80 ends up behaving like 17 or 18 for most of the opera and making all of the mistakes that go on. Um, the Goethe play was enormously long. It took him more than 40 years to write, and he never actually saw a performance of it in his own lifetime. But when it was published in book form, it became a huge success. And all over Europe, people were beginning to get interested in the, in the Faust idea, in the Faust legend. Faust became, instead of being a kind of gloomy, philosophical, kind of rational figure, he became a passionate figure. He, came, he became, in that great kind of sort of romantic tradition of people like Heathcliff and, and, and all that sort of thing. Great towering, brooding men full of passion that every woman loves and every man's supposed to envy. Um, and so he becomes the great kind of one of the great cult figures of the 19th century. And everybody is kind of going crazy to get in there on the action. The play gets translated or elements of the play get translated all over Europe. And um, it hits Paris in 1850 in a wonderful, wonderful play, I think, a re really brilliant play um, called Faust et Marguerite. Um, and it's called, it's called a dramatic fantasy. And in this play, we have basically the show that we're going to see this evening. Um, Faust falls in love with a very young woman, Marguerite. She's incredibly innocent. She knows nothing of the world. That represents perfection to him. That's what he wants. The devil, as part of the terrible, terrible pact that he makes, uh, agrees to sort of supply him with what he wants, and the consequences fell are really quite, quite awful. Um, so that's the story. The play was such a huge success, and it wasn't performed in a great kind of national theatre or Royal Shakespeare Company kind of place. It was performed in a little intimate theatre in what was known as the Boulevard des Crimes, the Street of Crimes, which is a sort of a bit of a giveaway to what sort of a theatre it was. Nothing at all like Clonter. Um, <laughs> and this was such a triumphant success that everybody started to bid for the rights, even Wagner, the great Richard Wagner was interested in turning Faust into an opera. Um, but the, the rights were finally given um, in the best kind of, you know, Phantom of the Opera, Andrew Lloyd Webber tradition. The, right, the rights of the book were finally given to, um, to Charles Gounod, who was at that time the rising young composer in Paris. And so Gounod embarks on a production of the, or a, a, a version of the opera um, for the Théâtre Lyrique in, in Paris. And again, the Théâtre Lyrique isn't one of the great houses. It's not the Opéra Comique. It's not the, 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 the National Opera, the Royal Opera, as it was, the Imperial Opera. It's actually a little house devoted entirely to the presentation of um, pieces by French composers, new pieces, interesting pieces, amusing pieces, popular pieces. Um, and what they put into the mix, which is quite extraordinary, is the idea of spoken dialogue. So most operas usually have, um, from beginning to end, a sort of sung texture. Sometimes the singing is with orchestra, sometimes the singing is just with a harpsichord or a piano or something like that. But in this particular version of Faust, or this particular version of the Opera Comique, um, you have spoken dialogue in the place where normally there would be these, what they call the dry passages, the secco passages, the recitative. So that gives the, the piece a different feel altogether. It's actually being driven forward by the story. It's being driven forward by the dialogue. And when we came to make the piece here for Klonter, we decided that we would go back to that very, very, very first version um, of, of, of Faust, the, the Guno Faust. Um, so what you see tonight is essentially well, it's either an opera with dialogue or a play with songs. It's up to you to sort of decide which way it goes. But that's, that's the kind of feeling of it. Um, the overall sort of experience is essentially, I think, very, very equivalent to a musical rather than to, um, you know, as I say, high-end opera and all this kind of thing. And what we really wanted to do was we wanted to try and capture that. So in our set, we've kind of gone back to the world of Paris in the 1850s, fantastically opulent, absolutely driven by pleasure, absolutely devoted to just basically wine, women and song. And that's, that's the, whole, the whole sort of story of Paris at that time. Anything was possible, everything went. And that, that's the world that Faust moves into. So we've tried to kind of evoke that. We've also tried to kind of reference the world in which um, this piece was first created. So it's not really a sort of an attempt to recreate a historical situation or a realistic situation for the drama. It's much, much more a historical situation connected with the people who played the piece in the first place. So this is almost in the sense um, that what you're seeing tonight is a team of actors in this theatre in the 19th century playing this strange and new piece called Faust, which is full of extraordinary possibilities. 
Um, of course, the business of dialogue is something that, 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 on the whole, most opera singers don't usually have to deal with. Um, and I'm sure that, you know, that, that, uh, that some of my colleagues won't thank me particularly for having added to their burden, because the thing about opera singers, I think, which is most extraordinary, um, is that um, somebody said on the radio the other day, what was, there was a great controversy, I think, when somebody, I think it was either Alfie Bow or, or um, um, Russell, um, the other guy from Manchester, yeah, thank you, was, 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 was described as an opera singer, and suddenly the Today programme burst apart at the seams with people ringing in and saying, he's not an opera singer, you can't call him an opera singer. And the next day they got on an opera singer, the wonderful Joyce Di Donato, who actually very calmly and very quietly explained the difference between somebody who performs with a microphone and somebody who actually does what these ladies and gentlemen are going to do tonight. She said the basic difference is that opera singers are athletes. They have to have the most incredible physical stamina just to simply make the sound that they make in the first place. Thereafter, they have to act like actors. They have to be realistic. They have to be convincing. And into that mix, I've also thrown um, quite a lot of tricky dialogue for them to, to play. So um, they really are tonight, they are the triple threat. They're singing, they're dancing, and they're acting. And that is something which I think is really, you know, quite, quite a remarkable feat. The singers who come to Klonta are always young singers. They're either people who are still involved in um, a, a training course of some kind, or they've recently graduated and they've just begun to make their first sort of steps in, in the big world outside. Um, it's a very, very challenging piece. It's a piece which is usually done by people considerably older than the cast you see tonight. And I think everyone in the company that I've been working with has done the most remarkable job in actually making this piece come to life. So I hope very much that you enjoy it this evening and uh, that this isn't your last time at Klonta or indeed at any other opera house. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.